Uh, welcome, everyone, to uh, the June Radical Community Webinar. My name is Timothy Byers. Uh, I'm the president of Radical Health and the chief education officer, and I'm joined, uh, as always, uh, by our CEO, Eloise Thiessen. Uh, the Radical Community is comprised of advocates and educators and healthcare professionals, uh, cannabis stakeholders, and we intend to provide support and information and resources to those members. So for information about how uh, you can join the Radical community, you can go to our website, radicalhealthcare.com, click on the community link. Uh, when you sign up, you'll receive access to uh, a bunch of stuff that's kind of behind the community. Um, it's not a pay gate, but a membership gate. Uh, it's free to sign up, uh, but there's a on-demand video library. It includes recordings of uh, all of these webinars, as well as additional interviews and other media. It's free to sign up and uh, there's no cost to being a member. Uh, just sort of add you to our email list and make sure that you have access to everything that we offer. Uh, I also wanna remind everyone that we have an array of curriculum options at a range of price points for students, working professionals. Whether you're helping customers make good product choices, whether you're treating patients, uh, if you're advocating for social change, maybe you're just using cannabis yourself. You need evidence-based factual information about cannabis. Radical Health Curriculum is up to date. It's comprehensive uh, and it's informed by uh, clinical expertise and experience and by instructional design expertise and experience. So uh, check out our website for more information. You can go to the website and click the education link um, or you can just reach out to us. Uh, medical disclaimer, uh, this presentation today is for educational purposes only and the information presented today is not intended to be a substitute for medical advice. Uh, the information is not meant to help in the diagnosis, prognosis, or treatment of any virus, disease, illness, or condition. If you're using cannabis as a medical patient, you're using cannabis as a medicine, please see a medical cannabis clinician. So today, we are talking about uh, Delta-8 tetrahydrocannabinol, uh, Delta-8 THC. And I, I recognize that Delta-8 uh, seems to be kind of like the shiny new ball in the cannabis and hemp space. Uh, but in fact, there is actually a long uh, history. Delta-8 has a long history here in the US. Uh, so we wanna look briefly at how uh, Delta-8 THC was discovered and elucidated. Uh, this is a picture of my second favorite cannabis chemist. This is Raphael Mishulam. Uh, he and his colleagues actually demonstrated total synthesis of Delta-8 uh, in 1965. And by 1966, the chemical structure of Delta-8 THC uh, that was isolated from cannabis was elucidated by a team that was working at the University of Delaware. So when we talk about structure elucidation, really we're talking about the process of determining uh, the chemical structure of a compound in three dimensions. Uh, however, we have known something about Delta-8 THC since the early part of the 20th century. Uh, Roger Adams, who is a very important chemist in cannabis, uh, his lab was at the University of Illinois. He actually created the first partial synthesis of Delta-8 and he published his results in 1941. Uh, and in fact, Adams and his colleagues uh, would also study the effects of oral dosing uh, of, of Delta-8 THC in human volunteers as early as 1942. So we've known about Delta-8 uh, for nearly 100 years now. Uh, so let's look a little bit more closely at what uh, Delta-8 actually is. Uh, it's a natural, uh, naturally occurring compound uh, found in very low levels in the cannabis plant. And like other cannabinoids, uh, it's very lipophilic, uh, it's fat loving. And like other cannabinoids, it's extremely viscous and uh, a colorless oil when it's at room temperature. And probably everyone knows this by now, I think Delta-8 probably popularized this word, but Delta-8 is an isomer of Delta-9 THC. And an isomer is, um, when we talk about isomers, we're referring to uh, each of at least two molecules that have the same constituent atoms. Uh, but they have different arrangements of atoms. So these molecules might have, for example, different bindings of atoms, different molecular shapes, uh, different orientations of those atoms. I think a good analogy is to suggest that you have two rooms with the same furniture, but the furniture is shuffled around a little bit in each room and it makes them distinct. 
So delta-8 uh, has the same chemical formula as delta-9 THC, C21H30O2. Uh, can anyone, you can put this in the chat or you can shout it out. Uh, can anyone think of another isomer of delta-8 THC and delta-9 THC? It's kind of important to our discussion today. Uh, the same chemical formula, C21H30O2. Ah, someone put in delta 10 and delta 11. That's actually that's pretty insightful. Yes, there are other isomers as well that are not quite as well known. Uh, did someone say something? All right, I'm just going to say it. No guesses. Actually, Debbie and, and Mary had two, two very good guesses. Um, CBD is an isomer of both delta-8 and delta-9. Again, it has the same molecular formula, C21H30O2. And we're going to talk about the importance of CBD and how delta-8 is made uh, in just a, a, a brief few minutes. Uh, so how specifically is delta-8 uh, THC, how is that isomer different than delta-9? Um, let's see, am I, yeah, here we go. Uh, well, uh, it has, uh, essentially it has a carbon bond, a double carbon bond that's located at a different position than delta-9. So you can see uh, these are 2D illustrations of these two molecules. And you can see that the only difference is really the position of the double bond. In fact, that's the reason why these molecules are called delta-8-THC and delta-9-THC. Chemists use a numbering system that's based on um, uh, carbon positions. And the numbering system used now is called dibenzopyrene numbering. And it's, uh, that numbering system is illustrated by the numbers in green on, uh, on the slides here. So uh, you can see that delta-9 has a double bond between the carbon atoms lab labeled uh, 9 and 10. And delta-8 uh, has a double bond between the carbon atoms labeled 8 and 9. And just as a side note, uh, when you're reading some of the older medical literature, uh, you're likely to see some strange uh, tetrahydrocannabinol names. So again, the system that we commonly use today is uh, to count the number of carbons is the dibenzopyrene uh, numbering system, but there are other systems too that chemists use. And one of the systems that was commonly used uh, previously was called the monoterpene or monoterpenoid numbering system. Uh, and that system numbers the carbons differently. So in the monoterpene system, you'll see delta-8 THC uh, being referred to as delta-6 and delta-9 THC is referred to as delta-1. So these aren't different um, cannabinoids, they're not isomers, they're just simply different ways to refer to uh, delta-8 uh, and delta-9. So because delta-8 has, uh, it, it's an isomer of delta-9, it has subtly different uh, effects than delta-9 THC. And, and later in the presentation tonight, Eloise is gonna speak to uh, the medical research and some of the therapeutic effects of delta-8 THC and the clinical applications. But we can look at some of those uh, differences right now as well. Uh, so for example, the chemical stability of uh, delta-8 um, protects delta-8 from oxidation uh, relative to delta-9 THC. It's a more stable molecule. Um, and this can increase, for example, increase the shelf life of some delta-8 products. Now we do know that um, delta-8 of course does degrade just like any natural compound. Uh, and when delta-8 THC degrades, it degrades uh, into CBN and that's when it's oxidized even further. So we do want to look um, just very briefly at some pharmacodynamic, pharmacokinetic effects of delta-8. Uh, first, we know that delta-8, uh, just as delta-9 does, it binds at CB1 and CB2 as a partial agonist. It, it does have lower binding affinity at both of these recep uh, receptors compared to delta-9. And we see multiple researchers, multiple teams of researchers have suggested that delta-8 has roughly half the potency to two thirds the potency of, uh, of, of delta nine at CB1 and CB2. Um, when we talk about potency, that's kind of what you'll see when you read about delta eight in the media. It's not quite right. It's not really the right concept or word. The strength of binding, uh, the interaction of a ligand at a receptor is really described by affinity, binding affinity. Potency um, describes the amount of a drug required to produce an effect. And then there's efficacy. When you have efficacy, that's the measure of the maximum effect of a drug receptor 
interaction. So really when we're talking about Delta eight versus Delta nine, we're talking about affinity and, and, and uh, also efficacy. Uh, Delta eight has two known uh, metabolites, 11 hydroxy Delta eight THC and 11 oxo Delta eight THC. And it's likely, we're pretty sure that um, the Delta eight is metabolized by the same enzymes that mostly involve uh, Delta nine THC. So CYP 2 C nine, CYP three A four. All right, so there are a lot of Delta eight products in the marketplace right now. They are mostly unregulated. So it's really important to understand how these products are made. Now remember that Delta eight occurs naturally in cannabis plants, but it occurs at very low concentrations and mostly it's through Delta eight um, or Delta nine degradation. So it is possible to um, breed plants and process those plants in a manner where some level of Delta eight THC can be extracted. That's rare, You're, we don't see that very often. Uh, and, and most Delta eight THC products are not made that way and virtually no Delta eight THC products that are available in the hemp space are, are made in this manner. Uh, the method used to make most Delta eight THC products is by converting CBD uh, or Delta nine THC into Delta-8 THC through a process called isomerization. And I don't wanna turn this into a chemistry lecture and I'm not qualified to do that anyhow. So we're not really gonna go into specifics about like the types of ingredients that are used, but we can really discuss this um, in sort of a, a formative way uh, at a higher level. And the first thing to note about this process is that Remember, it's not new, right? We've been doing, chemists have been doing this for nearly a century. And all of the methods uh, generally include boiling a cannabinoid isolate or a distillate in acid. So let that sink in for a minute. We'll talk about safety in a few minutes. Uh, and generally the workflow process is pretty straightforward. There's a stirred boiled action or a boiled acid reaction. Uh, then you have acid neutralization, uh, solvent removal, THC remediation, hopefully, and then testing. And that's really it. Uh, and these chemicals are easy to procure. Uh, there, uh, and there are plenty of demonstrations uh, and YouTube instruction videos to help you create these products. You know, this guy on the screen, he has a bunch of videos detailing how to make Delta-8. His are actually pretty good. Uh, this guy has some too. And uh, you know, it's not that hard to do. Uh, it is however, hard to do well. So um, what are the ingredients that, uh, oh, and, and also um, that's just on YouTube. If you just go, if you do a Google search on converting uh, CBD or even Delta 9 to TH to uh, Delta 8 THC, you'll get scores and scores. I spent all of um, three minutes and um, pulled up five or six. So what do we start with generally? When, uh, when these guys are making uh, Delta 8 products, um, what are the ingredients that they're starting with? Uh, again, most Delta 8 THC products are, uh, that are available are sold by hemp companies and hemp plants generally have a lot of CBD, but they also have some THC, right? They can have as much as 0.3% by dry weight uh, THC. And to make a CBD isolate product um, or, or a lot of uh, products or uh, broad spectrum, for example, in the hemp space, you know, manufacturers will remediate, they'll remove that THC uh, from the hemp and then what happens to it? It can't be used legally in the hemp space, right? Because any natural derivative of legal hemp must also be less than 0.3% THC. And, you know, obviously pure THC that's being extracted from hemp, is not less than 0.3% THC, it's 100% THC. So a lot of times manufacturers will actually use this remediated THC as the starting process for Delta-8. Sometimes they'll use CBD. But you know, from, from a manufacturer's perspective, you already have a marketplace for CBD. You're using that CBD that you're extracting from hemp. You're gonna throw away your THC, your Delta-9 THC. So it makes a lot of sense to start with Delta-9 if you're gonna convert it to Delta-8. The cleanest method is to simply use a CBD isolate. We're gonna talk a little bit more about specifics here. Uh, but here is a list of uh, some other, you know, some of the other types of ingredients that uh, are, are used for this conversion. And, you know, this isn't like the list of ingredients that you need. This is the multiple options from categories of, of lists of ingredients. So you can see that 
you know, in addition to the product that you intend to convert, so in addition to having like a CBD or THC isolate, um, you would also need an acid and you would need a solvent and you would need a wash and you would need a neutralizer. And, you know, conversion, and you can use any of these uh, in any of these categories. And conversion occurs pretty much with any type of acid that you select from this list. But the specific ingredients that you um, pick will determine the amount of time it takes for the reaction to occur. There, for example, there are some catalysts that you can add to speed up the time of the reaction. And then also the success of the reaction depends on the, the ingredients, meaning how much uh, Delta-8 appears in the resulting mixture. But this is the basic workflow, right? Essentially chemists boil CBD or Delta-9 THC isolate or distillate uh, they boil it in, uh, in an acid, uh, then they use, an, they use ethanol and a solvent and they stir it for one to 18 hours. And the process basically creates a slurry of reactions and it produces a lot of byproduct and some of those byproducts are simply unknown. And it's important to note that even if you start with a CBD isolate, it doesn't matter what you start with. All of these reactions will also produce delta nine THC. So, in a good, you know, in a good hemp product, in a good delta eight hemp product, manufacturers are going to need to remediate that THC again at the end of this process. Uh, and again, regardless of the procedure used, the the process does produce byproducts and a lot of unknown byproducts. And of course, there are there are also residual solvents that need to be removed as well. Now, generally. Acids are, are, they sound scary, but they're actually pretty easy to neutralize and remove. Um, but in that boiled acid reaction, and I wanna emphasize this point, I've said it a couple of times already, you're gonna produce a whole bunch of different byproducts. So for example, um, it's possible to produce uh, things like benzopyrenes in these reactions. And benzopyrenes can be found in things like coal tar and uh, tobacco smoke, they're carcinogenic. Uh, and they're only going to be detected if the manufacturer were specifically testing for them, right? Uh, insufficient testing, and remember, testing is expensive, will fail to detect harmful residuals, including unknown reactive byproducts, residual solvents, other potential toxins. And even if you see a COA, like you buy a Delta-8 hemp product and you see a COA and it says, hey, look at this, it's 95% Delta-8 THC, well, great. You still don't know what the other 5% is. You have 95% Delta-8 THC and you have 5% of some stuff that can kill you. Unregulated markets. You know, how many of these manufacturers are more concerned about byproducts or public safety versus profit margin? And somebody mentioned earlier in uh, the chat Delta 8 or Delta 11 and Delta 10. Some of these unknown byproducts are actually isomers uh, that we don't really know anything about. So, again, we're making a reaction. It's a slurry of byproducts. Yeah, most of it is that target that we're looking for, Delta 8 or Delta 9. Uh, but if companies aren't really, really careful and spend a fair amount of money in testing and chromatography, you're gonna get a product that is riddled with other stuff. Many of that stuff, we don't even know what it is. There's a lot of talk about whether these products are legal. Uh, the, the legal question really hinges on the interpretation of the 2018 Farm Bill. And of course the Farm Bill removed hemp and all naturally derived hemp derivatives from the Controlled Substances Act. In 2020, the, the DEA issued what it called the interim final rule. And the interim final rule intended to provide some clarification about some of the ambiguities uh, in the original 2018 bill. And the interim final rule stated that the farm bill, and this is a quote, does not impact the control status of synthetically derived tetrahydrocannabinols because the statutory definition of hemp is limited to materials that are derived from the plant cannabis sativa L, for synthetically derived tetrahydrocannabinols, the concentration of delta-9 THC is not a determining factor in whether the material is a controlled substance. All synthetically derived tetrahydrocannabinols remain Schedule I controlled substances. Now, there are some Delta-8 manufacturers who have attempted to suggest that their products are not synthetics at all, uh, that rather they're made um, uh, by their, their, their distillate products. 
And in fact, distillation is, is required to make a safe Delta-8 product um, because the chemical reaction produces so many byproducts and then the reactions, they have to distill it uh, at that point or do, or do chromatography uh, to separate the byproducts from, from the Delta-8. Um, but it's a, it's a bit of, um, it's a bit of sophistry, really. Uh, product, uh, Project CBD interviewed Greg Gerdeman. He's a neuroscientist and an educator. We like Greg uh, in the cannabis space. Uh, he said this during their interview. He said, quote, uh, they, meaning hemp manufacturers, they're calling Delta-8 a distillate, um, but it's actually a reaction product. Uh, you can cook the CBD in a strong acid and you're converting it into something that it wasn't. Uh, whereas with a distillate, you take a complex oil and you're removing part of it. It's not a process that converts one product into something else. Distillation is a refining process, not a chemical reaction. This is drug development, meaning making Delta-8. This is drug development, as far as I'm concerned, taking one molecule and turning it into another molecule. And I completely agree with Greg. It's clear that most Delta-8 THC products, pretty much all of them in the hemp space, um, they're, they're almost all uh, isomerized from CBD or remediated THC. They remain federally illegal, regardless of what anyone tells you. So what? The federal government thinks that all cannabis products are, are illegal, right? What about states? Um, I think that to date, um, 11 states, it's hard to, it's hard to really get a, a firm count, but I think about 11 states have outright bans on, on the unregulated sale of Delta ATHC products. Uh, for example, Colorado uh, dispensaries can't sell modified or synthetic versions of Delta 8 THC or Delta 10 THC that have been derived from industrial hemp. Uh, there are some states that have, uh, they published warnings uh, to hemp companies uh, to say that the sale of Delta 8 THC products are illegal under that state's existing uh, regulations. And then you have multiple states that are working on regulations to allow the sale uh, for Delta-8 THC products under new uh, regulations. So there's a bill in Michigan, for example, uh, it amends the definition of THC to include all structural, optical, and geometric isomers of, uh, of THC, regardless of whether it's been naturally or synthetically derived. Um, you've got another state that uh, has added TH Delta-8 THC to the state's list of controlled substances. Uh, Illinois is now requiring um, testing, packaging, labeling, labeling requirements for any product that includes a cannabinoid. Uh, there's a bill that's been introduced in Louisiana that requires all THC isomers of, uh, of Delta-9 to be included in the calculation of the 0.3% threshold of hemp. Uh, and then you have similar bills that have been introduced in places like North Dakota and Oklahoma and Oregon and Texas. Uh, it, it's a hot button topic. A lot of state legislatures are, uh, are starting to approach it. The big question is, are these products safe? Uh, Delta-8 THC occurs naturally in plants at very low concentrations, right? Mostly through uh, THC degradation. Consumers, however, are now taking Delta-8 THC in dosages that are not naturally found in cannabis plants. Uh, there's very little data, either in animal models or clinical, uh, data to test the safety of the cannabinoid in these larger dosages. But that said, there's really no evidence that Delta-8 THC is inherently dangerous. If you're purchasing a Delta-8 THC product from a cannabis dispensary in a well-regulated state, um, you should be getting a product that's safe to consume, you know, one that's been tested for potency and heavy metals and mold and bacteria and pesticides and other toxins. And if you're working through a cannabis clinician, that's also gonna increase your um, safety profile. Uh, however, most consumers are not purchasing Delta-8 THC from a state licensed dispensary. Uh, most of them are sold through the unregulated hemp market. Uh, I did a quick search on Delta-8 THC. All of these products showed up in Google Shopping. So um, they're widely available. I recognize that it's really difficult to remember anything pre-COVID, but do you remember this? Remember, remember the vaping crisis in 2019? We're now going to start dealing with those same issues with Delta A. You know, recall that prior to COVID, about 2,700 people were treated for lung injury and related illnesses that were caused by illicit market 
vaping cartridges. 68 people died. So to bring awareness to um, the similar dangers associated with unregulated Delta-8 products, uh, there are a few groups that are doing uh, some different things. I'm gonna talk about one, I'm gonna turn it over to Eloise, she's gonna talk about another. Uh, but this is the US Cannabis Council. They commissioned uh, the testing of Delta ATHC products that they purchased from uh, multiple companies in multiple states. I think you know, California, Florida, Nevada, Michigan, Texas, a few more, Indiana, North Carolina. Um, the, the US Cannabis Council, they're a national trade group so there's some, you know, they, they have some interest in regulated cannabis, but nevertheless, they, they're a trade group that represents state licensed cannabis companies and, and legalization advocates. And at the beginning of June of this year, they issued their report um, based on the testing that they had commissioned. Uh, and it described their concerns about widely available unregulated Delta ATHC products and the corresponding health risks. And they, the report stated that uh, this is a quote, the fact that Delta ATHC is being sold outside of the regulated marketplace with no oversight or testing and is readily available to children is alarming and it presents a public health risk of potentially wider impact than the vape crisis of 2019. So what, what are those risks? What are we talking about? Um, they, they can range from you know the benign, right? You might buy a Delta ATHC product that doesn't have any Delta ATHC in it because it's unregulated. Uh, to life-threatening, right? So Delta-8 THC vape cartridges can contain, you know, many of the same toxins that were responsible for the injuries and the sickness and the deaths associated with the previous vaping uh, uh, crisis. You know, re remember vitamin E acetate, we're probably going to start seeing the same kinds of, um, of ingredients in our Delta-8 vaping cartridges. So in April, you know, before they issued the report, um, they had a research team examine the contents and the labeling, the marketing of these products. Uh, the, pro the, the results were that the products commonly failed to include the amounts of Delta-8 THC listed on the label. They almost always included some amount of Delta-9 THC. They often tested positive for pesticides and heavy metals, and they often contain residual levels at uh, residual solvents at levels that were unsafe for human consumption. And this was a research team at, uh, at a laboratory in Massachusetts. They had 16 products, I believe. Um, and uh, the findings from the report, again, were nearly all of the products contained Delta-9 in amounts over the legal limit. Um, multiple products contained heavy metals banned by state cannabis regulations. So this things like chromium, copper, nickel, and lead. Uh, most of the products contain residual solvents at levels not safe for human inhalation, including hexane, methanol, dichloromethane, ethyl acetate, heptane, acetone, and isopropanol. And uh, this, is, this is the biggest thing, I think, is that the testing identified unknown ingredients in most samples. And these ingredients displayed similarities to some known cannabinoids, but they appeared to be new isomers uh, or unknown compounds with no toxicological characterization available. We have no idea what they are. So this is why it's, it's important to be concerned about unregulated products in the market. And we're starting to see some cases being reported through poison control. So the University of Hel or Virginia Health Poison Center uh, has reported an increase in Delta-8 THC-related cases in adults. So, you know, things like confusion, anxiety, tachycardia, these are, these are symptoms that we would expect to see uh, from, uh, uh, you know, over-intoxication, over-stimulation of the CB1 receptor. And then the Michigan Poison Center at Wayne State University in Detroit uh, issued a warning notice about Delta-8 THC products. They cited evidence of uh, adverse effect in two children who uh, developed sedation, slowed breathing, low uh, blood pressure, slowed heart rate, and they were both admitted to the intensive care. Remember that uh, CB1, over, uh, overstimulation of CB1 in children has an opposite effect as it has in adults. You know, in adults, we see things like tachycardia. In, in kids, we see bradycardia, suppressed respiratory function, and sometimes at very high dosages, even coma. I'm going to turn it over to Eloise. She's going to talk a little bit more about the safety and, and some of the medical literature and, and therapeutic benefits. <laughs> Way to end it and send it off to me, Tim. <laughs> I love it. Such a great overview. I think, you know, it's so timely right now to be talking about this. Um, 
and some of the safety considerations. I'll need your help, please, with the um, slide advancement. Um, so as Tim was mentioning from the US Cannabis Council where they did some testing on Delta-8 products, there's also another company out there, Leaf Report. And full disclosure, I do medical reviews for them, but they came out with their Delta-8 THC market report. And you know they don't um, get paid for this. They go out and they purchase, um, they've done this with CBD. So they go out and um, purchase CBD uh, products and do their own third-party independent testing with a lab company out of Las Vegas. So they decided to get about 38 products of a Delta 8 and have them tested. And they got about 20 products from brick and mortar, um, mostly in the, um, in the South. And they also got about 18 products from online retailers. Next slide, please. And interestingly, um, what they decided to do was give these different products um, a grade, anywhere from A through F. And anyone that failed, um, particularly if they had a high THC level that was above the legal limit, they did block out their name. Um, and that was intentional because they didn't want to encourage uh, <laughs> anyone to go out there and actually purchase Delta 9 THC. Um, so, um, but they had about 32% of the products received an A and just as many received an F. Next slide, please. And they, yep. And they found that about 68% of the products actually had the wrong amount of Delta-8 THC. So just like Tim highlighted with the U.S. Um, Cannabis Council, um, they were actually quite surprised to find that a lot of these products didn't even have um, labeling on them for how much Delta-8 was in the product. So um, in some situations, they couldn't even determine if it was the wrong amount because the labeling wasn't even up to standards of um, what we would expect to see now with the evolution in the CBD market. We definitely see products um, stepping up and trying, or brands stepping up and really trying to put labeling on there that informs the consumer of the cannabinoid content. Next slide. And they found that about, like I said, 34, so there's 34% of these products did not clearly list the amount of Delta-8 on the product. And they also found that with the um, brick and mortar stores, many of them didn't have a website that you could go to to try to look up a COA either. So it was really hard to find some information or even previous lab results on some of these products to compare them to. Next slide. And of course, I think most concerning was that about 53% of these products were over the hemp legal limit for Delta 9 THC and one actually contained as much as 15% THC. So pretty significant amounts. And I think, you know, from um, a healthcare professional's perspective, this is concerning for our consumers who um, may be under the impression that Delta-8 THC is going to be less psychoactive. Um, and of course, they may be unaware of the amount of THC that's also in their product. And as Tim mentioned, there are increased reports at the Poison Center about um, tachycardia and confusion and anxiety. So it could definitely be a combination of the Delta-9 and Delta-8 THC levels. Next slide. So looking at the medical literature and therapeutic benefits, we have to ask ourselves, are there therapeutic benefits of using Delta-8 THC? And is there any supporting evidence in the medical literature? We always wanna look at the medical literature to compare the results that we see in clinic. And of course the anecdotal evidence cited on the internet. The National Cancer Institute defines Delta-8 THC as an analog of Delta-9 THC with antiemetic, anti-anxiety, appetite stimulating, analgesic, and neuroprotective properties. The internet agrees, especially cannabis websites. <laughs> so is there any supporting evidence for these claims in the medical literature? Next slide, please. First, it should be noted that there doesn't exist a whole lot of data in the literature about Delta-8 THC. And if you haven't heard of Canakees, definitely would recommend looking at them. Um, we looked at Canakees, which is a platform that facilitates access to published science and aggregated critical data points. And they list only 10 total studies of Delta-8 THC. Only one of them was a clinical human trial, and one was a meta-analysis, one was a lab study, and six were in animal models. 
It should be noted that not all of these studies were looking at therapeutic benefits of Delta-8 THC either. So for example, one study was testing blood plasma levels after Delta-8 THC was applied via transdermal patch. And another was exploring how Delta-8 THC metabolites impact liver enzymes. And yet another was exploring how Delta-8 THC and its metabolites affect the development of tolerance to the hypothermia in mice. Furthermore, there are no human clinical trials currently listed on clinicaltrials.gov. So the information about Delta THC is scant, but there is some. Next slide, please. And as Tim mentioned, there's his second favorite chemist. Hopefully you guys will all know at the end who his first favorite chemist is. Um, but in 1995 in Jerusalem, led by Dr. Raphael Meshulam, eight pediatric patients with cancer were given Delta-8 THC to test whether Delta-8 THC would prevent vomiting from anti-neoplastic therapy. The patients were treated with a variety of anti-cancer drug protocols. And researchers found that the children could be administered doses of Delta-8 THC that were considerably higher than the doses of Delta-9 THC generally administered to the adult cancer patients. And they didn't have the occurrence of major side effects like of Delta-9 THC for the adult patients. Success rates were 100%, regardless of the cancer protocol used, and the total number of treatments was 480. So those eight patients were treated during a two-year period. Mishulam concluded that the complete success in preventing vomiting due to anti-neoplastic treatment in children with very few mild side effects suggests that Delta-8 THC might offer a new inexpensive anti-emetic therapy um, in the treatment against pediatric cancer or chemotherapy. Next slide, please. So according to the internet, Delta-8 THC produces effects similar to Delta-9, but without the paranoia or anxiety inducing effects. And articles and experts quoted here therein describe the effects of Delta-8 THC as uplifting, alerting, calming, relaxing, and so forth. There is no data in the medical literature to support this claim. And Delta-8 THC does bind to our CB1 and CB2 receptors, but with less affinity than Delta-9. So perhaps Delta-8 THC is not necessarily helping with anxiety, but it's not causing anxiety in the same manner as Delta-9 THC can in some consumers. That's the question. Next slide. Appetite stimulation. There exists one study in mice that suggests that very low doses of Delta-8 THC increases food consumption, even more so than Delta-9 THC. Furthermore, the research suggests that Delta-8 seems to improve cognitive function in the mice without cannabimimetic side effects, noted significant decreases in dopamine and serotonin levels, and noted that more activity in the mice was given, in the mice given Delta-8 THC. Curiously, they suggested that a low dose of Delta-8 THC might be a potential therapeutic agent in the treatment of weight disorders as the Delta-8 THC as the Delta-8 THC actually lost weight, as well as in the treatment of cachexia. Next slide, please. And there exists a couple of studies investigating the analgesic properties of Delta-8 THC. In one study, researchers tested the anti-nociceptive and anti-inflammatory effects of cannabinoids in an experimental model of corneal hyperanalgesia, extreme eye pain. These researchers noted that the topical Delta-8 THC reduced pain and inflammation in the cornea and that the effects were mediated via CB1 activation. Other cannabinoids also helped via the 5-HT1A and CB2 receptors. These researchers suggested that cannabinoids might be a novel treatment for corneal pain and inflammation resulting from ocular surface injury. Now, this is not to suggest that we want you to put Delta-8 in your eye. <laughs> In a second study, researchers tested a synthetic analog of Delta-8 THC animal, animal models of inflammation, and they suggested that Delta-8 THC experts, I'm sorry, <laughs> exerts potent anti-inflammatory actions with minimal CNS cannabimimetic activity. Next slide, please. Got to practice these big words. Anti-cancer, there was a study done in 1975 at the National Cancer Institute suggesting that Delta-8 THC as well as Delta-9 THC and CBN had the ability to slow tumor growth. 
And cannabinoids have been the subject of intensive research for their potential anti-tumor activity, especially in cancer cells that overexpress CB1 and CB2 receptors compared to normal tissues. As a partial agonist of CB1 and CB2 receptors, Delta-8 THC might have play a role in future cancer treatments. Next slide, please. So we know that we have clinical applications, um, sparse research, but a little bit to, to suggest that can, Delta-8 THC can help with nausea, vomiting, and anxiety, maybe some increase in ap appetite as well. Um, here in California, we're fortunate to have a couple of Delta-8 THC products that are available through the regulated cannabis market. And um, what you're seeing on the left there is a cannabis drink and it has THC, Delta-9, Delta-8 THC, and CBD. And it's marketed as, um, I can't read that, print's really small. Help me out here, Tim. I think it says Delta-8 THC for the body, Delta-9 THC for the mind. Is that correct? Yeah, and uh, four milligrams of CBD for the soul. For the soul. <laughs> um, so, you know, this isn't necessarily our product that I recommend for any uh, clinical implications. I have helped um, some people who want to replace alcohol, for example, and maybe have a drink that um, they can use as a, as a so social experience that's also relaxing and may elevate their mood. Personally, it puts me to sleep. <laughs> um, Level is the uh, company you see on the right and they make a Delta-8 product. They make what's called a ProTab. So that is an oral um, tablet that can be adjust, um, ingested. It comes in 25 milligrams. Um, and they also have a tab lingual, which is a sublingual product of Delta-8 THC in three milligrams that can be put underneath the tongue. Um, that is a product that I've used quite frequently here in California for my chemotherapy induced nausea and vomiting patients. Um, it typically works in about 15 minutes and can last for several hours. It does not have a strong euphoric effect and many patients find that it can help with their breakthrough nausea without them feeling impaired. And I would say I've seen about it work, it work about 80% of the time. Um, it's very low dose, um, but again, it's non impairing and um, at times I have used the Delta-8 Pro tabs, which are stronger. I usually have them break the tablets into smaller pieces um, and they'll get a longer lasting effect for their nausea because they're ingesting it. Next slide, please. And of course, all of this leads to the reason that um, we started to really investigate Delta-8 THC was because of a um, consumer had called in who had consumed about 25 <laughs> Um, gummies of 25 milligram Delta-8 THC unknowingly. So um, apparently this product was left at their, um, at their house and they didn't know that it was a Delta-8 product and they um, were in the military and had to go under drug testing and they were concerned that they were gonna fail a drug test. Now, when this person performed a drug test at home, it was negative, which I thought was really interesting. So the question is, are you going to fail a drug test if you use a Delta-8 product? And as good nurses always say, it depends. So you might test positive for two reasons. The first reason is simply because of the Delta-9 THC that may be in the product you're using. As we demonstrated with a couple of those different um, reports, there can be high levels of THC in these products. And remember boiling CBD isolate in an acid reaction will also produce that Delta-9 THC. So if the companies aren't taking the additional steps to further remediate that Delta-9 from the mixture, it will remain in the final product. And this is being reflected in those tests. And recall that some companies actually begin with Delta-9 source material because they have remediated Delta-9 from their other hemp products. So when you convert Delta-9 to Delta-8, there remains residual Delta-9 in the product. And if their testing or remediation is not sufficient, Delta-9 will remain in the end product. And the second reason is a bit more complex. Most drug tests are urine tests and urine tests don't test for Delta-9 THC. There's actually very little THC excreted in the urine because most of it has been metabolized into something else. So urine drug tests look for THC metabolites. Moreover, there are generally two types of urine drug tests that are used to detect cannabis, immunoassay test and GCMS test. 
Immunoassay tests are rapid and cheap screening tests. So you can do this with like your home drug testing kits. But despite the widespread use of these tests, there's very little published information on how to correctly interpret the results of these tests. Incorrect interpretation of test results can themselves result in a false positive or false negative result. Also, these tests produce high rates of false positives, meaning they might give you a positive result for cannabis even when you have not ingested any THC. We just saw this with an Olympian who had a pork burrito and tested positive for steroids. So, and she stands by that she has not used steroids. So, you know, you wonder. Immunoassay tests um, use antibodies to detect the presence of drug metabolites or classes of drug metabolites in the urine. So they can detect substances with similar characteristics resulting in false positive results. And while many immunoassay tests look for a specific THC metabolite, <clears throat> those are hard to say, many immunoassay tests are sensitive to several THC metabolites. You wanna tackle that one, Tim? 11 nor delta 9 tetrahydrocannabinol 9 carboxylic acid? Yes, and we're just gonna say 11 carboxy THC. Okay. <laughs> so if you have an 11 um, OH delta 8 THC or 11 oxy delta 8 THC in your system, this test might pop positive. So THC COOH is formally, is also formed by that CYP2C9 enzyme. And the final actual metabolite detected by urine test is called a glucuride metabolite that is formed by UGT1A enzymes break down 11 carboxy. So drug testing companies are obligated to use GCMS to confirm any initial positive results. And the GCMS is gas chromatography mass spectrometry, which is an analytical method that combines gas chromatography and mass spectrometry to detect very small amounts of a substance. GCMS test is extremely specific and it produces almost no false positive. It is, however, more expensive to conduct than an immunoassay testing. So how can you be sure? Make sure that you have a COA that lists all the ingredients, 100% of the ingredients. And I think as Tim mentioned, you know, we saw this with the, the vaping crisis, just because you don't see, um, vitamin E acetate on the COA, you know, you really need to question whether or not they tested for it. So that becomes, you know, just because there's apps, there's no evidence to support that there are these, you know, possible um, metal, you know, other ingredients in your product means that they may not have tested for it. So it's really important to be um, aware and savvy as a consumer um, and healthcare professional. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just add to the end of that, you know, in the, the 2019 vaping crisis, we did have companies who were using ingredients that aren't good for our health, right? Vitamin E acetate is the obvious uh, ingredient, but, you know, we also have other types of ingredients that were added to vape cartridges to enhance user experience, even though it wasn't good for us. In boiled acid reactions, again, I can't emphasize this enough, we don't know what's in it. They're, we're creating byproducts that we haven't characterized yet. So this, this industry, uh, this unregulated Delta-8 industry, really does um, have the potential to blow up into something much worse uh, than, um, than the previous one from 2019. And I think that's why it's really important that states are, are jumping on the regulation. We should be able to buy Delta-8 products through cannabis dispensaries that are regulated. Um, but we, we don't want to buy any unregulated Delta-8 uh, product unless you can be absolutely sure that you have the utmost confidence in, in the manufacturer who is making it. Yeah, and that you can have that COA to verify. I mean, it's, it's really, you know, sort of buyer beware right now around Delta-8 products and um, making sure that, you know, consumers have safe access um, to a product if they are going to use it. Well, we have, um, we have about nine minutes to the top of the hour. Uh, does anyone have any questions or comments? You can throw them in the chat, you can raise your hand, uh, you could shout out and maybe don't shout. <laughs> Uh, 
no questions about Delta 8 there. When you go out on YouTube, go to YouTube and type in Delta 8. Uh, there, there are hundreds of Delta 8 videos out there and some of them are uh, quite entertaining. Okay, here comes some questions. Takes people a while to type. <laughs> um, what do you think will happen on a federal level or do you think it will stay to the states? I think I'm cautiously optimistic that we will see federal cannabis reform during this Senate. If we don't, uh, if we don't have it during this uh, uh, congressional uh, legislation cycle, we might not see it for a few more years. Um, but I, I'm cautiously optimistic that we will see federal cannabis reform. Uh, Eloise, this one is a good one for you. What is the benefit to using Delta-8 versus Delta-9? Yeah, I think it really depends, um, you know, on the patient and whether, you know, if they're cannabis naive and, or if they've reported a, a high sensitivity to Delta-9 THC, you might want to consider Delta-8 um, since there's, you know, definitely some evidence to support that it's not as impairing or, um, you know, as psychoactive as Delta-9 THC. I rarely use it. Like I said, it's, um, I only feel confident in its implication for um, chemotherapy induced nausea and vomiting. So a lot of times that's, that's why I'm choosing Delta-8 versus uh, another cannabinoid. When I, when I have more research to, you know, let's say for anxiety, for example, I, you know, if the research really supports CBD is going to be most effective, I'm going to start there. Um, I might consider, you know, Delta-8 THC if all other cannabinoids have been ineffective for a condition. It's another, you know, kind of like, okay, let's see. <laughs> we know it's probably going to be well tolerated and relatively safe. So might consider it then. Um, we have another one here. Uh, Delta-9 metabolizes into Delta-11 when ingested. Delta-9 THC metabolizes into 11-hydroxy. THC when ingested, it's, that's, that's our SIP enzymes in the liver. Does Delta-8 metabolize in a similar way? Um, sort of, it, it, uh, it goes to 11-hydroxy Delta-8 THC, and then get, that gets metabolized into 11-oxo Delta-8 THC. And we think that they're both metabolized by the same SIP enzyme. Um, let's see, uh, there's, a, there's a good one up here too for you, Eloise. This is a do you think that the most effective product will be just Delta-8 or some combination of the different isomers, Delta-9, Delta-8, CBD? Yeah, I, I think that's a great question, Debbie. I think it really, again, kind of comes down to, um, you know, having, having the ability to, to work with products a little bit more and establishing some best practices around dosing. Um, you know, can we use a Delta-8 THC product with a little bit of CBD and, and THC, is that going to be more effective than a Delta-9 or CBD? I, I think there's definitely potential there. And again, I, I love having access to cannabinoids here in California. I'm very fortunate um, to be able to explore that with patients and, and gather some of that um, clinical data to support, you know, what, you know, what cannabinoid seems to be working best. I, I love the idea of being able to eventually uh, compound cannabinoid products. Yeah, so a similar, uh, a similar concept. It, Peter asks, is Delta-8 ever made synthetically? Um, well, that's a trick question, Peter, because all Delta-8 products <laughs> are made synthetically. Um, but no, there haven't been any that have um, run the gamut of FDA approval. Um, there was another one in here. But, oh, do you Cindy. recommend Delta-8 for patients experiencing nausea from morphine after surgery? Yeah, I, I haven't because I don't usually get to see, usually it's such an acute experience, they might still be in post-op. Um, so I haven't had a, a situation, it, it certainly could be something to consider. Um, my concern, um, and I don't remember if we touched on this, Tim, but you know, it, the the one side where you pulled up the products that you can purchase, first of all, I loved that one was $799. And I want to know if anybody's actually paid that, <laughs> that product. Um, but the buds and flowers that you're seeing available are these pre-rolls, they're being sprayed with the Delta-8. So they're likely CBD flowers that are being sprayed. And so I don't know that I'd even want these people to, in, you know, inhale any of these products um, at this point while we're still 
quite uncertain about all these other potential, you know, byproducts that happen when it's synthesized. Uh, who was the chemist doing uh, Delta-8 THC work in 1942? That was Roger Adams, my favorite cannabis chemist. Uh, do you have any specific brands or manufacturers of D8 products uh, identified by industry analysts as having superior or safer uh, uh, safety profiles? Yeah, it's part of what LEAF report tried to do. Again, they um, try to bring transparency to the industry and they're not, um, they're not paid by these brands. So if you go to their report on Delta-8, you can see the grading system that they offered from A through F. Um, and again, you know, they'll, they, they're very transparent about how they gave those ratings as well. So a lot of it was, you know, the THC, Delta-9 THC level was within that 0.3% that the testing of Delta-8 was in 10% of the label. Um, those are some of the ways that they determined an A through an F um, product. And so there's some, um, some guidance there for the consumer to, to find a trustworthy brand. And so Philip, Philip is asking about a safe uh, Texas brand. I think that that's probably your best bet as well as to maybe look at Leaf Report. Uh, the, the two products that we showed tonight from, they were from Cal, uh, California cannabis dispensary. So they will not ship uh, across state lines there. Those are uh, highly regulated through the cannabis industry. Um, yeah, Philip, I am seeing a lot of um, Texas brands making Delta 8 THC. Um, in fact, one, um, one came through uh, Leaf 411, but I, we haven't vetted them yet. So I can't say yet with any confidence. And then the last question, because we're right at the top of the hour here. Uh, are you familiar with SunMed products who use water extraction processes? I am not familiar with their company. Mm -mm. No, love, love the idea of water extraction. However, mm -hmm. I would be surprised if, they're, if that company were making Delta-8 products with water extraction, again, because it, it occurs so low uh, in such low concentrations that I, I don't think extraction really is a viable um, uh, process for, for getting Delta-8. Um, we are at the top of the hour, so I think we're going to go ahead and, and close it down. We want to be respectful of... Um, of everyone's time. I wanna thank everyone for attending tonight. Uh, we will see you again in about, uh, maybe about one month. Uh, we haven't decided on our next topic, although we are kind of, um, we're thinking about maybe doing our um, immunotherapy uh, topic that we've been thinking about doing, but th these other things come up all the time. Um, I, I, I do wanna say that I have noticed that there are some people who are just joining here at the top of the hour. Um, we did start at 4 uh, p.m. Pacific time, so um, you, you missed it, uh, but we are recording this and uh, we're gonna upload it to our YouTube video and we'll send out uh, a notification when that is available. So thanks, thanks everyone for uh, your attention. Thank you, Eloise, for joining me tonight. And yeah, you, uh, we'll see everyone soon. Thanks everybody.